um, a, a question to uh, – sorry, sorry. Uh, Robin Collins. Um, a question to the first speaker. Uh, um, it's quite clear that the uh, frequency of, um, of crisis climate events is on the increase. Um, my question is about the optics and the, the, the technique that we should use when uh, a particular event occurs and then there is, um, you know, this was caused by, you know, the tornadoes in Ottawa. This was caused by climate change. Um, when we know that we can't, we can't say that any particular event was, but the frequency of events and the likelihood of that happening is there. So we have to be, in terms of our credibility, we have to be careful not to associate a specific event can you comment a little bit more on that? Uh, Jerry Schmitz. Oh, I guess we're taking all the questions together. Uh, a question uh, to Rohinton. Uh, yeah, I find the uh, idea of using border carbon adjustments through the WTO regime intriguing, but I'm just wondering, is there any current uh, nation state member of the WTO or group of countries that's prepared to push that idea? I mean, obviously we know the current American administration is hostile to globalism of any kind. But I just wonder, you know, because it would have to come from some group of members, it seems, to really have a, a chance of being uh, viable. Meta Spencer. Uh, one thing that uh, seems to prevail here, and not just here, but everywhere, is that uh, the focus is entirely on uh, reducing carbon emissions and not on uh, any of the new technologies that would enable uh, ambient carbon to be reduced and, I mean, uh, captured and, and uh, either recycled as fuel or put, put away. Um, and yet there are new technologies, and I know that David Keith at uh, Harvard has a new uh, method that could be scaled up at quite a cost-effective uh, level. Uh, and I don't know why that's not talked about more. Can you explain? why we're, we're only focusing on carbon emission reduction and not anything more. I'm Doug Alton. Um, everything is related, and one thing that was mentioned last night, hadn't been mentioned today, is proportional representation. You know, if we had a, a more uh, public-oriented system of electing people, we might still have a carbon tax in Ontario. And this terrifies me, and I think it's very closely related to uh, getting on with environmental problems. Hi, my name is Robert McBride from uh, Leap Montreal and uh, from uh, Council of Canadians. Leap Montreal is on unceded Mohawk territory. Um, I'd like to, uh, first of all, um, congratulate Mike on, on his work. Uh, those of us who are street activists uh, are day-to-day uh, -day in the trenches with uh, regards to uh, uh, dis global uh, climate change disruption um, owe a lot to your work, especially in our struggle against Kinder Morgan. And I'd like to, and I have never heard of the group of 78 before, I sounded like a group of, a diverse group of painters for, who paint <laughs> landscapes. <and> uh, <laughs> we just learned about this, so I already made that joke. But, um, and so, yeah, I, I realized last night that uh, this is uh, consciousness raising um, adventure here. And so I'd like to ask Mike to share with us some names of other folks who are working on, um, on uh, climate change to raise public awareness. Uh, I'm aware of people in the U.S., primarily uh, many people, and of course there's Naomi Klein and uh, Darja Mayal, uh, I would recommend strongly to people here uh, who writes for Truth Out in the U.S. But I was wondering if you have other people, and there are many more that I could share if people would like to talk about this. But uh, because we need this, it's a, an epistemological issue. People don't know uh, how serious and uh, how serious the, the crisis is and how much we need to radically challenge the system, including capitalism, by the way. Good morning, uh, Scott Vaughan. A, a question for Mike as well, and just to echo, um, Mike is one of the great crusading uh, journalists in Canada, so we all owe him a tremendous debt. Uh, my, my big question is, um, <laughs> How, and this without getting into political, but, but you used uh, access to information probably more than any journalist during the previous government of Harper. How would you compare that government with this government in terms of how forthcoming and transparent they are? Uh, yeah, Andrew Jackson. 
Uh, I had a question for Rahenton, and I appreciate the, uh, the ideas you were putting forward in a constructive way, but I, I'm a bit skeptical about the, the WTO and the possibility of achieving progress within that context. I, I think in the, in, the, in the context of Canada, when we talk about transition to a new economy, I think a lot of us talk about the fact that workers will be displaced from particular sectors, the carbon dependent economy, and we'll find new job opportunities in the new post-carbon economy. The, the problem is for that to succeed in a country like Canada where we're relatively weak technologically compared to many other countries, simply moving from carbon, a carbon economy to a non-carbon economy is likely to include a big increase in imports of you know, wind energy, solar energy, simply because the technology has been developed elsewhere. So the appropriate response to that, in my view, is to have some sort of national industrial strategy where we can actually make sure as some sectors are downsized, others increase. But the WTO was struck down very explicitly, uh, Ontario's green energy strategy, which was designed to do that. So if we're going to make this notion of a transition for work is like we do need national tools to do it. And it seems to me that WTO is not well suited to that task. Uh, Urban Waller, I'm, uh, I feel like an Archie Bunker here. I don't understand half the acronyms that you're using. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, Gordon, I, I, I have a couple of questions for, for you. Is there a TED Talk version of what you said here? Because I think it would be wonderful. And what are you doing to train the uh, meteorologists that uh, are uh, informing us a little bit about the risks? And I'm uh, really disappointed that uh, there hasn't been any mention of uh, the Canadian banker that uh, went to England. Uh, I, he has made it very clear that there are grave economic consequences from uh, not doing something, and uh, I think it's very important for us to find allies that are outside the movement. It's wonderful to see so many people in the movement, but let's uh, also work with some uh, people who do have a major impact on our economies, like Carney. Uh, Lou Auerbach. I just want to uh, add a bit of a, a addition to Andrew's question, uh, and this is for uh, uh, Rohinton. Uh, you mentioned a number of things that were possible, and I'd like to have your views on what's feasible, what's likely, because you had some very interesting suggestions. To me, they seemed, well, that might be hard to do, but maybe not. Hi, Paul Beckwith. Um, we all know the stories of, of people in Quebec that died because of the heat waves and humidity this summer. It's hard to believe that people would die there because of these heat waves and not die in Ottawa and Toronto and Windsor and Hamilton, all these other cities. I'm sure the mortality rates were higher. So I think this would be a great, you know, hook to see how is climate change affecting people, you know, locally, right? And it's just a matter of polling the morgues in all these cities and then looking at the total curves of the numbers and matching them to the heat waves. Sim simple. Yes, Ardeth Francis. Um, I would just uh, be interested in knowing, yeah. uh, in knowing what kind of progress is being made by the government in restoring science projects that were started, that were cancelled by the previous government. Thank you. Ken Johnson, I'd like to thank all the speakers. Uh, and Mike, uh, the incredible work you've done. I have just two quick points. First of all, I wouldn't mind if you expanded on the, I know the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives in collaboration with some universities and such are doing a deep project looking into the exact fossil fuel industry connections with government in Canada. I don't mind if you talked about that a bit more. And it was also that National Observer um, yearly subscription. How much is it, Mike, and how do you get one? <laughs> I think we'll take two more questions. Hi, Jeff Passmore. I uh, chair the Scaling Up Conference. You might have seen some postcards on your table about it. If you're looking for solutions to a, uh, 
uh, uh, transition from hydrocarbons to carbohydrates. Um, two observations that are a little bit different than what we've heard so far, and Mike, this might be something you're interested in reporting on. Moody's is now uh, doing credit rating uh, risk assessment on the carbon emitting sector. Airlines, autos, oil and gas, coal, regulated utilities, all these sectors are at risk of having their credit ratings reduced because of not being part of the transition uh, to a non-carbon. And we have to be careful when we talk about non-carbon because we need carbon in order to be able to live. So, uh, <laughs> you know, let's not talk about it. And then the second point is with respect to the private sector, um, I think that, uh, you know, if, we were, if government is on the critical path, then we're kind of screwed. Um, the private sector is going to do stuff in response to the market and in response to the public demand. Why did Pepsi create uh, the uh, plant bottle? You know, if, you, if any of you have seen the Dasani water bottle with the little wrapper on it and a little picture of a plant, so that bottle is 30% carbohydrate based. And if, you're, if you work for Coca-Cola, sorry, not Pepsi, Coca-Cola owns Dasani. So if you work for Coke, uh, probably the first thing you think about when you wake up every morning is how do we screw Pepsi? Well, now guess what? Pepsi and Danone and Nesty, they're all now getting into the carbohydrate-based plastic bottles to get away from hydrocarbons. So competition does work, market demand does work, and I think, uh, you know, if, if we were going to rely on the government, we're not going to achieve anything. I'm a national observer um, subscriber, and I think that Mike really understated um, how important they have been. I'm a member of the environmental activist movement, and th they have provided entry points all along the way around so many issues. Energy East, National Energy Board got totally reorganized because of the work Mike did, and they have won so many awards. This is tiny, tiny little outlet that beats all the big guys like the Globe and Mail. So I'd like to hear about some of the awards that you have gotten. <laughs> Very quickly, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, I'm going to put group some of them together. One of the big things we as scientists need to better improve on is our ability to communicate. Most scientists get no training at all on communication. They never understand things. I had the fortune or misfortune of being a government bureaucrat for six years, so I learned. Uh, but I also do probably about 20 or more public talks per year to audiences of rotary clubs, business groups, seniors, high schools, etc. And I find this is important for us to learn to better communicate and, importantly, to get the message out. So we can better explain, as the first question was on the business of, you know, did that tornado do to climate change? Well, that tornado, you cannot say yes or no explicitly, but you can argue, as we do, if we learn to communicate better on the issue of the uh, frequency of occurrence of these kind of things. So um, we are trying to train meteorologists uh, at the Canadian Meteorological and Geographic Society. I've organized for several times now a bringing in a professional trainer on media communications to give side sessions and that kind of thing. So we're going to do it in Ottawa year after next, right? Um, but I think that's important. But I'd like to say quickly that science pro uh, research programs on climate change have not been reinstituted by this government. I'm very annoyed. I used to, I set up and got $100 million from Paul Martin, the Canadian Foundation for Climate and Atmospheric Sciences. We gave out over $120 million in grants in our 10, 11 years. The Harpers, of course, refused to even speak to us, let alone give us any more money. That project has never been renewed or brought back to being. I was told just yesterday with a talking that the high Arctic observing programs and things have one year of funding and told, well, you know, we'll see whether we'll give it for you next year. We need an integrated, sustained program on climate science. Um, the question of the heat waves, I think one of the things we have in difficulty is that different hospitals, different municipalities do different ways of saying, well, that person died due to heat versus dying due to a heart attack. Well, what brought on the heart attack? Maybe it was heat. We don't know. So the, the data on health impacts is very difficult to think. Um, uh, the last thing I'll say is that, although I really like meta and stuff, uh, 
we work on things, but I think we have to be very careful about the use of some of these geoengineering kind of approaches. I'm not sure what David's latest thing is, but we have shown scientifically that when you fire all that stuff into the stratosphere, you create acid rain. You can acidify the oceans. There was this project people funded to put, I forget what it was, stuff to fertilize the oceans so they'd soak up more CO2. Well, it actually doesn't work. I mean, we need to have, and that's what this foundation I used to chair did. We did s detailed scientific studies of some of these geoengineering methods. I'm not saying we should turn them off, but we have to be very careful about the side implications of them. And the other thing I'd like to say is that politically, the people who don't want to do anything about fossil fuel will love the idea of geoengineering because then they can say, ah, we can just continue to use it all and we'll just geoengineer it so it doesn't matter. Well, I don't think that, I think there needs to be some detailed assessment for that. And if I can ask a question of my friend Rohinton here, one of the things I have with trouble with, with border things, WTO kind of stuff, is, is the embedded carbon within the products that are being shipped across the board. How much, money, how much carbon was used to make at a cheap price that gadget with the resulting emissions, say, in some country, and then they ship us the finished project, and, and it doesn't have the carbon physically in it, but it has the carbon in the process that we ended up in. So we need to worry about that. I'm not sure if that can be dealt with by WTO kind of processes. Jerry, Andrew, Lou, Lou, and now Gordon are, are skeptical about the WTO, and, and I'm, not, I'm not here to defend it, uh, obviously. Uh, I, I think, Gordon, um, if we did go to a global regime, we'd want to use life cycle analysis to get that right. So, you know, among, among all the sort of nitpicky and important things, uh, that are said about why we shouldn't go there is exactly well. Will we get this? Will we get it right? Will we get the details right? It seems to me that you you first want to at least agree on the principle that carbon is the kind of thing where you can't have 168 prices for it. That there has to be one price because it's a social good and it's got social positive and negative spillover effects. And and then you take it from there. Uh, it's not as if when we measure labor standards um, that we have it right exactly on what constitutes labor standard dumping or not. So, you know, that's why you have the dispute resolution mechanism, which was one of the few things in the WTO that is said to work and is now, of course, like everything else, they're languishing. But on, 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 on the specifics of that proposal and, and the three uh, questions about it, Jer what, what I find most interesting is there are, I believe, some European countries that would see this, because when you think about it, the European Union has a border carbon adjustment regime, right? So, so it's, and you know, you could say that many federations have a border carbon, carbon adjustment. But it's interesting that the opposition comes from particularly developing countries. And so, so China and India are not keen and it's a replay of the deba debate from decades ago on labor standards, that this is our comparative advantage. Why are you taking it away from us? But you know, as, as I said before, where you stand depends on where you sit. Now, China's making all these investments in, uh, in green tech. It will soon be a green tech net exporter if it isn't already. And at that point, it will change its tune. So I mean, these things are not going to happen overnight. Changing international organizations and their ethos doesn't happen right away. But when it does, I mean, again, now, in, you know, the, many of you will be instinctively allergic to the organization. And I understand why. But you know, the IMF, the IMF of today is not the IMF that it was 20 and 40 years ago. But it takes that long for, for them to come around to some of these issues because they're multilateral. And so I think one has to promote an idea. And yes, uh, technology and climate change don't wait for multilateral organizations to react. But I don't know of any fast track here. Um, I find interesting that, um, yes, the WTO is not n industrial strategy friendly. On the other hand, there's a ton of things that we, c I, I have a colleague, Neil Desai, who's written on how the governments can use a procurement policy in a WTO compatible way, for example, to encourage small and medium enterprise in the digital sector, in the cyberspace. Uh, initially, the, the thinking was, no, you couldn't do it. But the, the fact is, there's ways to do it. Uh, this creative, when you look at the countries that have succeeded in the cyber and the digital and the IP world, South Korea, Estonia is often held up, 
uh, Israel. These are not countries that are big and powerful, but you have to know how to navigate those rules. And we have a couple of papers at CG coming out. I'll be happy to send you advance copies that really make the point that industrial policy is making a comeback in the cyber era. Uh, and that there's ways of doing it that is WTO compatible. At the very least, I'd say, nothing prevents a Canada from investing more in its green tech sector uh, or creating more incentives for that to happen. Uh, whether it then becomes an export sector is when the WTO comes in. But our innovation record is not strong, and there's no reason why it couldn't be stronger, and, and we, we can't just blame the WTO for it. How much is all of this feasible? The G20 is certainly working on aspects of, adva uh, of um, advancing AMCs, uh, advanced market commitments to, to other sectors, including green tech. I think consortia of laboratories on green tech, if they don't happen in the public space, are already happening in the private space. And so aspects of this are coming out. And on TRIPS, at this stage, I'm not at all hopeful that TRIPS reform will happen anytime soon. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, one of the good things that happened when the U.S. left TTP was that um, the TRIPS plus provisions of it fortunately were held in abeyance and everyone benefited. Explain what TRIPS is. TRIPS is the Global Intellectual Property Agreement that sets minimum standards on how to protect intellectual property allegedly to, to stimulate innovation. And the evidence since then has been that countries that have enforced TRIPS have not seen more innovation or inward investment. Um, just a final point, uh, no, I, I won't go there. I'll, I think people want to hear from Mike and his subscription rates. <laughs> well, just before he does, I wanted to say, I forgot to say, I was in Beijing last week for the World Conference on Science Literacy. We put out the declaration on, the Beijing Declaration on Science Literacy, and they're very fundamentally important to try and get an improved understanding of science by all of the community. And that's an important issue. Sorry. OK, thanks. I'm trying to figure out where to start. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start with uh, Scott's question, um, just in terms of government transparency. Um, I, I think, and, and I, I can maybe address other issues, like in terms of uh, science and, 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 and evidence. Um, you know, I think it's, it's terrific that the government has, has appointed a chief uh, scientist or chief science advisor, which is an important step towards ensuring that all decisions made in government are based on science and, and that now that there is there is a watchdog for the entire government and there's this requirement to create science policies in, in, in all the in all of the departments or at least all of the science based departments. So that's that's an important step to to ensure that the policies before the minister makes a decision that it goes through a process uh, that that checks whether it is evidence based and 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 makes sense. Now the government promised to, you know, be more transparent. Uh, they've introduced a proposal to 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 change the Access to Information Act that takes some small steps. It hasn't been approved yet. Uh, or hasn't been adopted yet by, by Parliament. It's still kind of lingering. And, you know, there's some things that are good about this legislation, I think, and, and some things that people have complained about. Uh, I think it's, it's an important first step, but the government has to go much further. In the past week, um, you know, uh, the stuff that, that we wrote about Kinder Morgan and about the government rigging the decision, making the decision before... It had actually consulted with First Nations. Well, last week I got back an access to information request with one of the emails that I know shows that orders were given within a meeting. And they have censored the words, um, you know, where, where a, 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 bureau, a public servant summarized those instructions being given. So, of course, I've, I have to challenge this. I know eventually I'm going to get that smoking gun, but right now they've censored it because they say it's embarrassing. And, and of course, <laughs> well, they use, they use a section of the act that allows them to censor stuff that it's embarrassing, that's discretionary. So... The thing is, like, this this evidence, though, I mean, it can come out in court. This is probably a reason why if the government decides not to appeal, it's probably because it's afraid 
if it appeals on the grounds of saying that it did fulfill its duty to consult, it will be forced to release this email in its entirety. Um, so we know that one way or the other, either the government won't appeal or it'll be forced to appeal and then, and then disclose this information into the public record. So one way or the other, I mean, um, you know, there's an example here where they're not being transparent. They could be more transparent, and if, if they were, uh, you know, if they were to modernize the law and, and, and answer questions and be open, you know, these sorts of things wouldn't happen. There's still situations where we ask, um, you know, pointed questions about policy, and we're getting talking points, and we have to push and dig deeper. So it's not a completely open book uh, in terms of what, what we need to know. Um, so where do I go from subscriptions? Um, I, you know, for, for people who cannot afford subscriptions, we've made a point of, of, of telling people that if you cannot afford a subscription, you know, talk to us or, you know, reach out on our subscription page uh, and we can work with you or we can find ways to make sure that you have access if you cannot afford. But it does cost tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes in the six figures to complete a single investigation. In the case of Kinder Morgan, it was two years, so it's clearly more than $100,000 worth of resources that we put in, including travel, including my time and the time of editors. And and so, you know, we, we ask that uh, people pay $12.99 a month. Uh, it's $140 a year to subscribe to National Observer. Um, you know, last week I was sitting, I was on vacation in Banff and I ran into Glenn Murray, the, the former Minister of, uh, of Environment in Ontario. I was telling him about our subscriptions and he pulled out his credit card and started to uh, subscribe on the spot, which was really, really nice. Um, there's there's also a uh, benefactor subscription that um, you know if, if you want to give a little more to support special investigations we we provide that option as well um, so instead of 139 you could pay 199 a month and then just knowing that you're contributing to giving giving something yeah to giving giving something a little extra but again you can subscribe at at um, at twelve ninety nine a month, if you use a promo code Mike, you can get twenty percent off um, <clears throat> when when you when you subscribe or sign in. So, um, and again, if you cannot afford a subscription, you know, let let me know or or just email us through our subscription page, and we'll we'll work with you. Um, you know, in terms of awards. Um, you know, I, I was honored last year to be recognized by the Governor General and our entire organization, you know, for the work that we did on Energy East, um, you know, getting a citation of merit through the, the Michener Foundation. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's thanks to, you know, a lot of what, what civil society did in terms of using our work. And, you know, that's, it's, it's a bit of a, you know, two ways, or there's multiple people that have to be involved to make sure the media is successful. We provide the evidence and then, you know, what people do with that evidence, it's up to you, it's up to politicians, it's up to members of the public, it's up to industry, and they can all choose and decide how, how to use this information. You know, in terms of covering Energy East, I, I remember that when, um, I had reported on some of those uh, those protests in Montreal, uh, the, 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 the demonstration that occurred that shut down the hearings. There was, there was within the NEB, you know, one of the top ranking officials had made a joke saying that, um, you know, at, at future events that the NEB participates in, uh, perhaps it's best if, if, if our staff are armed with tasers, uh, just in case we run into some unruly protesters. So this was a joke that was made inside, um, in, inside closed doors at the NEB that I reported on. And after this, um, the NEB decided to hire a private investigator to try to find who my sources were inside. So for that, uh, last year, the, the Canadian Committee for World Press Freedom um, gave me honorable mention for, for the work that I was doing to defend press freedoms and, and kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of important that reporters do their jobs and not have to worry about governments hiring private investigators or hiring the police to, to investigate you just because you're talking to sources who are or whistleblowers who are um, uh, defending the public interest and, and doing the right thing. Um, you know, in terms of reporting on, on technology, you know, I want to say that the National Observer has a 
has a clean energy series that we we launched last year where we look at new technologies and options uh, solutions where where there are options it, it, it's not necessarily carbon capture I mean we have addressed that issue and we've looked in particular at the boundary dam and and other projects like quest uh, the shell project um, looking at how much is needs to be invested to to deliver on these solutions. I think you know some of our reporting has has demonstrated that there are cheaper options in terms of switching to renewable energy uh, to avoid fossil fuels altogether. Um, so you know some of our reporting, we're looking at all of these things and trying to do more. Again, we 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 need we need readers to to share and and, and distribute this work um, and hopefully pay for it um, to help us do more. Um, in terms of uh, who I would recommend, um, maybe I'll, I'll throw out a couple of names and, and then maybe throw in another plug for, for National Observer. Naomi Oreskes, uh, uh, a researcher, uh, professor, has has authored the book Merchants of Doubt, which I think is 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 an incredibly good piece of work. There's also a movie um, that that speaks about um, what what kind of challenges we face now in, 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 in public dialogue and, and what are the things that lead people to be confused about what, uh, what needs to be done or what governments need to be done or need to do. Well, I think it just remains for me to thank an extraordinarily stimulating panel. Obviously, we've not resolved questions, but then we would have been foolish to expect that. But I think uh, we have put on the table many issues that deserve thought and uh, we've made some progress and I think the National Observer has brought a, a, an element of, uh, of direct action, if you like, uh, which I think is very welcome and very important. So I'd like to invite you to thank the panelists